So Heinrich Bildhoff from the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen Oops, will speak about an old dream of mankind, how we can take off. And uh, it's, I think, uh, yeah, the dream gets further to realization every year, but it's still a little bit of a dream. <laughs> so we will see. Yeah, I th uh, after really three days of uh, very interesting science talk, talks, I thought I'd go a little bit lower on science and, uh, and talk about science fiction and about a dream which I had uh, since I read my, my first science fiction novels. And uh, this is about personal air vehicles. And actually, this dream is of personal, air no, no, personal aviation is really not new. It's almost as old as aviation itself. And, uh, and a lot of different designs have been tried out. And, uh, but still, we cannot uh, buy these personal air, air vehicles because there are also a lot of drawbacks in the current designs. They need a pilot license, they need infrastructure. And so far, mainly the focus of all these efforts in personal air vehicles was more on the vehicle design. But when the European Union came out with an out-of-the-box study about the future air transport in 2050, they had one part of it was about personal air vehicles. And they explicitly said that designing the air vehicle is only a relatively small part of overcoming the challenges. The other challenges remain. So they put out a call for personal air vehicles for proposals, but explicitly saying not to design an air vehicle, but really look at these, these issues, the open issues. And then I thought, OK, that's my chance. To, to work on, on my old problem. After 40 years of writing papers, I thought I could have a little bit of fun and, uh, to, to go back and, uh, to, to my old and, uh, and, uh, dream. And, and I put together a, a team of and, uh, leading universities and, uh, in Europe. Liverpool is, is very, and, uh, very strong in, in uh, helicopter handling qualities and ETH and EPFL very good in computer vision and uh, automation. And the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology has actually a technology assessment in the team and uh, the German uh, space uh, agency DLR uh, is, uh, yeah, I can show you in a second what they do. We, we divided up the work, what we wanted to do in three work packages, automation and autonomy, human machine interfaces and training, and uh, the socio-technological environment. And the automation and autonomy uh, was done, and these issues, uh, which I uh, highlighted here, are addressed by our colleagues at ETH and EPFL, and, uh, the human-machine interfaces and training by these three, you know, four partners, three, three partners, and the KIT was an, an institute for technology assessment looked at this uh, socio-technological environment. So I don't really have to the time to talk about this four-year project in, in detail and just highlight only uh, what, what these different uh, were, were doing once more here. The challenges, recognizing obstacles and, and other traffic. And, uh, and basically the idea was to use uh, computer vision and cameras and replace the eyes of the pilot and augment the eyes of the pilot with, with uh, an automatic recognition systems and uh, also recognizing landing areas where something goes wrong you know, with your personal air vehicle. And I, I think you, know, you, you would appreciate if you would get some help to find where you could land. And you know, a big problem is, of course, the in all season and at worst weather conditions. So you know, that is the goal. But I think that there we really have to do the automatic landing recognition is, is done very well. But in all weather conditions, we are not yet there. So the next thing is you know, you know, develop response requirements for, for PAVs. You know, basically, what we want you know, is you know, we don't want any infrastructure. So what you need and, and the challenge which we set ourselves is 
I mean, what it, would it be you know, to drive to work and to avoid the, really the traffic jams which we have every morning and every you know, evening when we come home from work. And, uh, so what we wanted is, is really a vertical takeoff and, uh, and landing capabilities. And uh, this, we all know, hel flying helicopters is uh, one of the most difficult uh, air and, uh, vehicles to, to really control. And so we wanted to make the average car driver into a helicopter pilot. We need a lot of automation. And uh, that is something which we looked together with, with Liverpool. And as I said, identifying the hurdles for introducing PAVs when we talked about this, and of course, the first thing is, I mean, I don't want things flying above my head all the time. It's bad enough that we have so much traffic and then we have the traffic in the air. And so what are the objections and what also are the benefits? So we did actually in three different in the countries, in, the, in three different places where we had simulator facilities, we, we did some studies with the, the general public, got them into a simulator, let them fly a PAV and, give, and gave them the scenario how it would be in the future. And, and then uh, the guys from KIT you know, did questionnaires and interviews and looked at you know, the concerns, but also what, what they really liked about it. So, where it could. And in tubing, I mean, we are interested in, in, in human per perception and cognition and action. And uh, here we thought, you know, when, if you really have a personal air vehicle, I mean, you, you need some help. You know, the current flight controls and displays which you have in an airplane is not something what uh, the average car driver can deal with. And also what, what is, is still really amazing to me, even in, in airliners like the Airbus, I mean, they, they have now wonderful glass cockpits and, and a lot of instruments, but the flight control is a side stick, and that is basically, it's like a joystick and, and does not even have feedback. And the left and right seat, the, the pilot and co-pilot co the side sticks are not even linked together which was actually you know, the reason of a, a terrible accident. So you know, that's what we wanted to avoid and really you know, look at something what we do in our real research in the Institute, multisensory perception, vision and haptics, and also vestibular research. How can we all put that together into a new vehicle? And then also, I mean, if we design things, you know, we wanted to look at, at you know, the workload. Does it really help when we build new you know, highways in the sky? So, I mean, if you go up in the air, there are no roads in the air, obviously. So we built and tested different kinds of highway in the sky displays, but we wanted also to go beyond it. So, I mean, these highways should guide you around noise sensitive areas. So you don't want to buy and fly over cities or villages you know, where people would complain and also you don't want to get too close to, to an airport. So you, you have highways in the sky which you should follow. But you know, we also you know, had a haptic you know, stick which had force feedback. So when you got too close to the boundary, you felt the resistance. So I mean, and we can have actually a shared control that you actually cannot even leave the highway. So if you are really n n go into an area where you are not supposed to go, we can, can avoid this. So, and n here we are at the novel n human machine interfaces, the haptic shared control. We, of course, need automation n for this, n what n our n ETH guys n were working on. N so, if you really want to fly a personal air vehicle, you need a lot of help. And what we built is an autopilot, and, but you, and what you have also in airliners, but actually you want also to feel what the autopilot is doing. So actually we have a control mis mixing between the human input and also what the um, an autopilot is doing and we can change the weights of these mixing from very little to uh, very high. And uh, so you are always in the loop. And also there are different preferences. Some people I said, oh, I, uh, I mean, I don't want to fly. I mean, let, let the autopilot. They believe in the, in the safety of the autopilot and others say, no, like me, I enjoy flying, so uh, maybe uh, I, I take over myself. So, I mean, this is all uh, possible. 
and uh, with this haptic uh, shared control. So in order to, to measure actually in, uh, the different devices and how, how beneficial it is, and this is actually from our in, uh, demo day at the end of the project at the in, 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 uh, airport in Braunschweig where the DLR is, in, uh, we had people in, uh, with an EEG cap and in, uh, Actually, that's uh, uh, Frank who was leading the project with me, so it was not somebody from the audience. And he demonstrates uh, with eye tracking where, where we are looking, and he has his haptic uh, feedback device. And actually, we also had other people trying to do this, and with only very little training, they could go down the tunnel in the sky, the highway in the sky, and fly this, because they, they had help from, from the autopilot. And with the eye tracking, with the EEG, you know, we, we could measure the workload and also where, where they are looking. So then we thought you know, maybe, you know, I mean, we are you know, driving cars you know, since 100 years with the same kind of interfaces, you know, which are you know, brake pedals and you know, an accelerometer you know, pedals, and we have the steering wheel. So why not you know, use these? Can we fly a helicopter you know, with these kind of controls? And on the left, you see you know, what you can do with these controls. And on the right side, actually, you see in a, in a cockpit in a view from an EC-135 helicopter. It's a fly-by-wire, fly-by-light helicopter, which is a research helicopter you know, where we actually can change the control behavior of, of, of these inputs to all the way to the rotor blades, and that's at the DLR, this is a research helicopter, and actually in a test pilot flew, and initially they thought this is a totally crazy idea, but actually they, they kind of enjoyed it. Unfortunately, we couldn't show that at the demo day, at the last day, because for the, the research helicopter, which is a very expensive and very complicated machine, was grounded. So we couldn't show it, but we, we got people in, uh, on our demo day into in, uh, the simulator, which they have there, the DLA uh, simulator. And here you see somebody flying and in, uh, going to Braunschweig Airport, and he is in, uh, really enjoying it and you know, later they switch over the, the panel. So the other one, you know, the controls you know, to the other one. So you know, people could really land you know, the you know, research helicopter with the PAV handling quality. So it was not a real helicopter, but I mean, it was our fixtures in a, in a personal air vehicle with simple you know, in handling qualities with you know, automation helping them to fly these complicated beasts, and, and it worked in a, in a very well. So, so the project is, in a, in, in, is finished, and all the reports are in a, publicly available on the website, on the MyCopter website. So we, in a, we don't have this funding from the EU, but I'm, I'm, I'm still interested in it, and I do in a, continue the research on helicopter augmentation in the lab. This is our cyber motion simulator, which is a unique simulator where we actually put at the end of a robot arm a cabin with a stereo projection system in it. The front is we project on a virtual reality scene, whatever we want. And we have either steering wheels or we can also have flight control sticks in there. And we can actually fly. And uh, here we, we did some experiments where we, we gave uh, naive people, our basically uh, students in the lab, uh, some 20 minute instructions how to fly a helicopter. So they knew what the different things were uh, supposed to do. And uh, this is, uh, they, they were supposed to have a, of, of course, this is impossible. You cannot learn to fly a helicopter. And here you, you see the results. I mean, this is a lateral error. I mean, they're all over the range. And, uh, so, I mean, they cannot fly in, uh, on the spot. But if we give them the handling qualities of our PAV model, which we developed in, uh, in this project, they could do that with 20 minutes of training they could have a lateral error of one to two meters, so they could be on the spot. 
Of course, this is only a model of a thing which does not exist, but you know, we are currently you know, working on, on uh, auto -plier, auto augmentation, and I have you know, two wonderful you know, control in engineers from Italy, and we are working on, on different control schemes. You know, the control engineers among you will probably know what H infinity dynamics is and mu synthesis. So, I mean, these are two different control schemes which we implemented in a physically correct helicopter model, which was developed by another uh, Italian uh, control engineer over the years. So uh, you can see, I mean, you can actually basically do that uh, in simulation. The next step is, of course, to put it in the, into a real helicopter. Yeah, and this is actually a helicopter pilot. Now, we have uh, actually two helicopter pilots in, um, in the lab. One is a former military pilot, but he's out of shape. He, I mean, in principle, he should be at more or less at zero. But uh, uh, he, he had it basically with a lateral error of uh, a meter or two. So he could do this kind of job. Just to show you how it looks like when you are sitting in the cabin, I mean, of course, this is a distorted view because we have a curved screen into which we project with our stereo projectors. The goal was here to go to this little square with a PAV dynamic. So, I mean, go there, do a pedal turn at the end, and go in front of the hoverboard so that you know, what you see in a second, so he is there, uh, he arrived. And, uh, this is really not a helicopter pilot, it's one of our students in the lab. And then he, and this is a hoverboard, so this little thing has to be in, uh, he has to go up a little bit, and then uh, from the view uh, of, of the cockpit, and actually that's the way in, in reality also helicopters you know, and the performances and handling qualities are tested. So we simulated that in virtual reality, and then we record the lateral deviation within this green square. So, I mean, that was one of uh, the, in, uh, tests which we did and, uh, of the different models which we developed and it's actually a, a, a great game the the students really liked it and we had people in, in, in a kind of competition who could do better than the others so of course this is a brain mind in, 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 uh, <coughs> in machines in, uh, Symposium, so I, I thought I showed you that we actually can do a little bit of recording. I showed you already that we do EEG, but we just got a NIL system, and actually for our heavy machines which we have, with a lot of electric, big electric motors and a lot of other electric noise, we, we switched over to NILS. And uh, actually, for uh, there was recently a TV show in primetime uh, TV from ARD, the uh, science show, and uh, they wanted to see uh, uh, and wanted to get demonstrated that you can actually record brain activity in uh, in, in in flight. And uh, so, actually, this is a famous actor from uh, in, uh, the longest-standing crime series in Germany, Tatort. I think it's going on for over 30 years. And, uh, <clears throat> And so we, we show that you know, he, he's holding his breath, and so then you can see actually, you know, and that was for demonstration for, for the TV audience, that you, know, you can actually see in the oxygenated and deoxygenated you know, blood in, you know, in, in the brain. And this is, you know, well, there was just Xander de Winkel, and he's doing this experiment. He's just starting this on our simulators, you know, on uh, actually to, to see not only workload, but actually to, to look at Q, visual vestibular Q integration, which we have done also in the past, but we want to do that now and, and look really into the brain while we are in an integration information from, from different in the sources. And actually, if you want to do Q integration, the biggest problem with simulators is that they actually cannot accelerate very much and you cannot accelerate very, very far. And so I built a new kind of simulator, which is limited in size, basically only by the hall which we have, because we have very heavy and very strong motors. We have 470 horsepower. We can accelerate the person with 1.5 G all over the space. So in principle, we can have now much longer acceleration phases. And 
then the visual stimulation which we do in our Q integration experiments is with a wireless and an onboard virtual reality system. We have the Oculus and also the HTC Vive. And yeah, and then you, you can actually fly through the mountains or you know, we have a group which is working on driving simulation. With, I mean, we have all the, the car companies around, so they are interested in that too. So <clears throat> around Tübingen, Stuttgart area, so that's we do also some, some uh, in a driving simulation. <clears throat> so just this, in a, and again for this in a German science TV show, we wanted to demonstrate and something which is very, very important for pilots. In a visual flight, in a visual in a pilots who have no instrument rating, when they fly into a cloud, they are lost. And we wanted to demonstrate that, that our vestibular system is not really very good to keep your attitude in flight. So we, we trained him on our augmented helicopter. So he learned in half an hour to, to control basically our thing. And then we took the vision slowly away. And the question actually to the TV audience was, how long can, can he actually stabilize the helicopter when he has basically only in his vestibular system and, and very poor vision. So you can see nah, it, it was really very, very shaky at the end. And nah, then nah, nah, we stopped it because it looked very, very dangerous. He was courageous, nah, the, the TV actor. And nah, he, he did it, nah, yeah, 30 cent. Actually, there's a wonderful YouTube video if you are interested in this problem. Actually, you have, when you fly as a non-trained pilot, you have about 120 seconds and, uh, before you fall out of the cloud and, and crash. And, uh, because our vestibular system, if you have no visual reference, you, you are lost and you, you cannot keep. That's why we have artificial horizons and other instruments in the plane. But if you know, don't know how to read them, you are basically dead. So back to the question, are personal aerial vehicles the next big game changer? And, uh, as I said, many concepts exist and, uh, over the years and there are, every year there's something new. And uh, this is here, and the e young is, is the latest. And, uh, there has been quite a bit of research in, in Europe and, and, uh, through this out-of-the-box study. We, uh, the MyCopter was our project, but there were other projects uh, related uh, in, in this area, and so they are all completed. And, uh, European funding is switched now in, in a different direction, so there are no calls for this. But there is also now a lot of activity in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, we were recently at a workshop. And, uh, Joost, my co-author, yes, I'm ready in two seconds, uh, four minutes. And, uh, they presented, Mark Moore from NASA and they presented actually in, uh, for the Bay Area the concept how much time you can save if you could just uh, cross the Bay and not get stuck in traffic and what time and, and, um, you, you could really save. And uh, they also did an estimate of, of how many helipads are really, if you really want to do that, where could you go and, and take off vertically. And these clever leaves at the highway intersections, and, um, they took that into account. I thought that was a clever idea. So there is also an, uh, other activity and there was some kind of this Z zero, Z arrow and, uh, was kind of a uh, yeah, secret and, uh, that Larry Page was involved and I recently read that in, in Bloomberg. So, I mean, it's really open now. That is really, he didn't want to, uh, to let uh, the world know that he is working on flying cars, but uh, they are. And, uh, and uh, one of the patents they, they have is uh, that these things can actually fit into a standard uh, shopping center parking space. So. And the latest thing, which actually now made a lot of fuss also in the U.S., because the Chinese at the Consumer Electronics Show came with this vehicle, and which is a coax helicopter with four, I mean, basically it's a quadcopter, a coax quadcopter, men carrying. And the idea is to have that as an air taxi, so not even flying yourself, and you just say where you're going. 
And the, the state of Nevada again, actually, I mean, according to the source here, uh, wants to help them uh, to get that uh, through the FAA regulatory processes. And, uh, so we'll see. So far, none of them are really certified, except one from Germany. And that's a helicopter. And uh, I just want to show you this basic. 2010 entstand the idea. You can Ein read Jahr it. Flogen wir einen 2013 feiern wir die Weltpremiere des Volocopters mit den ersten unbemannten Flügen. Nach drei Jahren Entwicklungsarbeit erhielten wir endlich die Zulassung für die Teilnahme am deutschen Luftverkehr. Yeah, better read what, what, Heute what, mache ich mich auf den Weg. So, I mean, it started really with a crazy idea. I thought you probably saw that. I mean, a gymnastic ball and, uh, with and, uh, rotors attached to it. Somebody was sitting on it and, and made a YouTube video. Right after the YouTube video, that got viral. And they, I don't know how many in, in hits they got, but they also were get hit in, uh, by the German. Uh, federal authorities and, uh, because of course that was totally illegal but they didn't care they started a kickstarter cashed quite a lot of money to, to do this project and now they uh, just uh, this in, uh, in a couple in, uh, of weeks ago they had in, uh, their first flight and it's certified under a new category in in germany and, uh, so it's an ultralight in, uh, vehicle and uh, so you still cannot buy it, but they, they want to, I mean, they are still need for, for building the factories and so on. They need more money, but they want to, to sell it. So, are these the next game changers? I think right now there is, everybody talks about an, an autonomous driving, and that will definitely solve some of the congestion problems. I mean, people are thinking even of um, getting rid of red lights and highway intersections. If the cars are all talking to each other, I mean, you can just go and flow through each other. I think then better they don't have any windshields or um, show movies in the car. I wouldn't like to be there in that. And, uh, but I don't think that alone will you know, solve the problem. I think you know, we are still building more and more roads, you know, even though we cannot really maintain the roads. I think what, what we need is to use the third dimension and fly above and not on the highways. You know. So, and the ideas which we developed in, in this you know, MyCopter project was really put very nicely you know, together in a, a movie you know, which was sponsored by you know, the Swiss uh, banks, so we could never make such a nice movie and, uh, for the Vision Swiss Energy and Climate Summit. And I just want to show you the movie and then I really stop. And, uh, because this captures, I mean, basically the idea of what, what, what I'm dreaming of. And, uh, yeah. Roads and streets are completely overburdened at peak traveling times. In 2013, drivers in Switzerland were recorded as having spent over 33 million hours in traffic. When translated into economic figures, this unproductive time results in costs of around 1.62 billion Swiss francs. The expansion of our motorways is gobbling up our precious cultivated land and also costs a great deal of money. On average, 60 million Swiss francs for each kilometer of federal road. The cost of building a third lane on the route between Bern and Zurich has been estimated at 10 billion Swiss francs. It's time for a new visionary mobility system, a system that ensures that people can be transported between the 10 largest cities in Switzerland efficiently and quickly while conserving resources. A new flight corridor will be created 50 meters above the existing motorways stretching from Geneva to St. Gallen and from Lucerne to Basel. High-tech multi-copters that carry 12 passengers will run safely and without causing any traffic between the major cities or their hubs at short, regular intervals. The multi-copters are equipped with the latest navigation, collision protection and safety technology. 
with flights setting off every few minutes at a transport capacity of 1,500 persons per hour. Up to 120 multicopters will run in both directions between Bern and Zurich during rush hours. No cultivated land would have to be used, and there would be no need to spend any money developing the motorways. The new system is efficient. Next generation high capacity batteries will supply power to the extremely efficient electric motors that drive the rotor blades. The power stored in these batteries is generated from renewable energy sources. The multicopters can set off as and when they are required, but only when all 12 seats in the vehicle are occupied. Once you have landed, you can then use local public transport to travel quickly from the respective hub to your final destination. So that's also the idea, to integrate it really into the current transport system. And I think that uh, was a, a nice a vision. I have to show the last part because they, they sponsored it. But I want to thank you for your attention and I have to thank the team. So it started with uh, Frank from uh, Aerospace Engineer from Delft and now yours with uh, the man in green shirt. And, uh, he took over and then we have our wonderful control en engineers from Italy and uh, a very good team you know, to support our uh, simulators and research. Thank you. Thank you, Henry.